<laughs> That's a good thing. <laughs> okay. We could talk to you sideways, but that would be a little. <laughs> No, as long as I'm, I'm vertical, that's okay. All right. So to speak. So I have the... just have just reminded everybody who that you are John Harrison and that you have a book out today called The Columbia River from Arcadia Publishing. And I mm -hmm. was hoping you could just start out by letting everybody know a little bit about the book. Um, I know I've gotten to see it, but most people won't have been able to see it yet. So if you could just talk a little bit about like, what does it cover and how is it formatted, fit formatted and that sort of thing, that would be lovely. Yeah, I don't have one in front of me, but I imagine you do or I could go grab one. The, um, so Arcadia Press produces a, um, a series of books called Images of America. And they, uh, they're usually micro-focused on very uh, discrete parts of, of local history. So for in Portland, for example, there are probably no fewer than seven separate titles on Portland things. There's one on the Rose Festival, there's two or three books on Lake Oswego topics, and, and so on and so on. I think they have more than 7,000 titles. If you look up Images of America on the website, you'll see it's a huge, huge bunch of stuff. Um, so I, last December, I got an email kind of out of the blue from their acquisitions editor who asked me if I'd consider writing a book about the Columbia for, the, for Images of America. Images of America books are uh, uh, books of historic photographs with captions. So it's not really a narrative. It's just a, it's a narrative in the sense that it's a narrative told through pictures and historic photos, and those photos. And so um, my first question was, huh, I've seen your books. Uh, they're all the same size, and they're, um, they have very, very uh, strict limits on the number of words, no more than 18,000, the number of photos, 180 to 220, and the length of captions, depending on how many photographs there are on each page. And so it's, it's, a, it's a difficult <laughs> challenge to, to write any book to fit all those different little parameters. Um, and they count everything in the total word count. So the captions, the credits, uh, everything is counted toward 18,000. So my first question was, how do you, how, how do, you do a, a book in, within that tight format about the entire Columbia River? Is that possible? Do you really think that's possible? So she sent me a copy of the book on the Mississippi River. And so I thought, yeah, okay, we should do this. <laughs> and um, so they have about six or seven river books, and um, this is one of them. Um, so that's how it all got started. And they gave me, this was last December, they originally had planned to publish it next spring, spring of 22. But then about a month ago, they sent me an email and said they had an opening in their November, um, December print schedule, and could I get it done by then? And I'd already finished the, the draft text, so I thought, well, yeah, I probably can. So I did. Um, Arcadia requires every book to be read by at least one local historian. But again, when you're talking about the entire river, how many people are there who, who know that? So what I did was I found five people who I respect as historians of the river in different ways. So. One of them, Bill Lang, is a former professor at PSU. He's a friend of mine. He's, his knowledge of the entire Columbia is encyclopedic. Um, Irene Martin is a historian of the Lower Columbia River, has written several books. Uh, Kyle Cush is a director of the Arrow Lakes Historical Society in British Columbia and the Cusp of British Columbia, and he's also an author and historian. And um, Eileen Delahanty Perks, who is also an author, lives in Nelson, BC has written a lot about First Nations up there. Um, she was one, so I had five readers, and they all, they all nitpicked all the way through this. But in the end, I, um, I feel I got about as close as I could, given what I did, what I had to do. And um, I am perfectly willing to accept that it's not perfect, <laughs> that um, I told, I wrote what I thought was important and I, you know, undoubtedly left something out. And I'll, I'm sure I'll hear from them, <laughs> those people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
so anyway, that that's kind of how it got started and where how it got to this point. So I'm curious, you have lived and worked along the Columbia River for a long time now. And as mm -hmm. you were researching this book, you know, you, you had a lot, you brought a lot of institutional knowledge to this book, you know, that you knew before you going in. And I'm really curious if you learned something you didn't know before, you discovered something really interesting in your research um, that, that was either surprising or just really fascinating that was something that you hadn't known of before you started? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I, I think the answer is um, I didn't find anything new that I didn't know before. But what I did find a lot of was um, enhancement of the things I already knew about. For example, I knew that logging was important in the lower Columbia. But I didn't know how important, and I didn't know when it started and where, and how important it was to local communities. Uh, I knew that fishing and the commercial fishing in the Lower Columbia River was hugely important, and and was for years, decades. Uh, I knew that there were over 80 canneries in the, in the salmon canneries in the Lower Columbia, from Astoria to about um, the Sandy River, a little farther up, and then. Above Salilo Falls, uh, there are 10 miles owned by the Suford Brothers Cannery, uh, Suford Brothers Fish Company in the Dalles, and they ran fish wheels and they had their own cannery. I, so the, the, the importance of the commercial fishery to the economy of the Northwest, the importance of Lower Columbia logging to the Northwest uh, was huge to me, and I really learned a lot about that. Uh, one small example, Simon Benson, who we all know was an important um, uh, early 20th century businessman in Portland, the Benson Hotel and, and so on, the Benson Bubblers, the Fountain. Uh, he, his business was in logging and he had sawmills in California, particularly in the San Diego area. And he, uh, it was very expensive to ship these large, huge logs from the lower Columbia all the way down to California to be sawn into lumber, but he came up with an idea for a raft that uh, would about a million board feet could be tied together in a cigar shaped raft, big long, you know, 150, 200, 300 feet long, 50, 60 feet wide, all these logs chained together. And then they would drag, they would be pulled by a tugboat down to San Diego and then would feed the, the lumber market in, in Southern California. I didn't realize how big an industry that was until I, I looked into it. I didn't realize how important culturally and economically the commercial fishery was in the lower river until I looked into it. And then in the other end of the, of the basin, I'd always known that, I've always known that um, the loss of salmon in the upper Columbia area as a result of the construction of Grand Coulee was a, a, a huge problem, a huge thing. But I, and I knew it was important to the First Nations up there, the tribes, but I didn't realize how important. And, and so in doing some more research on it, uh, I opened my, when I talked to uh, Kyle at Arrow Lakes and to Eileen and Nelson, and, uh, and over the years I've met First Nations elders uh, in, in British Columbia through my work, um, that understanding, not only of the importance of salmon uh, and steelhead to the indigenous peoples there, but even more interestingly, how important they were to the non-Indians who lived along the Columbia, the, um, the farmers, for example, people who owned farms and ranches and lived in the small communities along the river. Fishing in the upper Columbia Basin across the international border was, um, was important economically and culturally to those people as well. Now, it's a totally different type of of cultural and economic importance. But nonetheless, um, my eye, you know, eyes were open in a sense to how important the fishery was to those people and how much they lost when Grand Coulee was built. And then how much more they lost when the Columbia River Treaty Dams were built and those productive farmlands, the most productive farmlands in southeastern British Columbia were flooded and whole communities had to move. And so I got some great photos from Kyle at Arrow Lakes of, um, of, of the movement of these buildings. People literally floated them um, one direction or another up the Arrow Lakes, uh, which is the Columbia River impounded, uh, not impounded, but natural 
uh, wide spots in the Columbia River about uh, beginning about 40 miles north of the border and going for about 120 miles. Beautiful area, very steep canyons, uh, and once full of productive farmland uh, that was only accessible by water for the most part. So the steamboat industry there was huge. And that's another thing I didn't know much about, but I learned a lot about researching this. So I guess I'd say that the cultural importance of the economic activities from Astoria to the headwaters to both uh, Indians, First Nations, well, Indians slash First Nations and uh, non-Indian, non-Indigenous peoples um, was uh, kind of a revelation to me. I, I just didn't realize how important it was. Before. Interesting. So I, I'm also curious because I've been able, I've been able to see the book because of course I could cheat and peek in the box ahead of time. <laughs> and I'm, so I've been able to see some of the pictures and that sparked a question Mm -hmm. That's kind of theoretical, but maybe more practical as well. Like I'm, I, I'm aware a little bit, you know, being nonfiction writer myself, that like you can wish for pictures for a book that you may or may not be able to get. So I'm curious if there was a picture that you really wanted in there that just didn't work out. And then I would love to know like, is there a picture that you wish existed that didn't exist yeah. that could have been? That's another part of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the answer to the first question is yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there were some that I would love to have had. Uh, I was lucky in one sense in that uh, they were on page 126, I think it is. There's a beautiful photo of uh, the Columbia River taken from the Portland Women's Forum Park, mm -hmm. looking east up the gorge, and you can see uh, Crown Point there, and uh, the, the Vista House, and, and it's foggy in the background. You should see that photo in color. <laughs> and oh, I, I just yeah. beg them, could you, yeah. could you please run that photo in color? And they, they don't like to run color. They have, all has to be sepia tone. Yeah. But it's yeah. still a stunning photo. Um, that photo was taken by a woman in Portland, a, a photographer, well, she lives in Hood River actually, her name is Kate Hodgkiss. And um, she, when I contacted her about the photo, she said, sure, you can have it. I, my normal charge is $250 for publication. And um, I couldn't afford that. Uh, Arcadia doesn't help with, with, photo, with money for photos. So I relied a lot on free sources, the Library of Congress, the Washington State Archives. I paid for a lot of those photos, but I didn't pay that much for any of them. Yeah. So I just said, you know, I'm, I'm really sorry. I wish I could, but I can't. So we had a nice long email conversation. And in the end, she said, oh, just use it. So I said, oh, great. Thank you. <laughs> there was another photo just like that. There's a great photo on page 72, I think, maybe of a young man holding a salmon in, near the town of Briscoe. And Briscoe is about uh, 40 miles north of the headwaters in Columbia. And so it's a thousand miles, no, it's more like about 25, 30 miles. It's about a thousand miles from the ocean. And what it shows is that uh, photographic proof, if you will, uh, uh, to back up all the other examples of uh, people, that people wrote, explorers wrote and so on, that salmon spawned all the way to the headwaters in British Columbia. 1,100 miles, 1,200 miles from the ocean. So here's this poor salmon that is dark. You can tell it's a black and white photo. It was taken in 1910. And you can tell by the, he's holding up the fish looking very proud. Um, you can tell by this color that it's, it's spawning. Well, the guy who owned it, the man who gave it to me was, works for the Canadian Columbia River Intertribal Fisheries Commission, which is kind of the Canadian equivalent of a Columbia River Intertribal Fish yeah. Commission here in the U.S. And uh, his name is Bill Green. And Bill, I asked Bill and said, hey, is that, I assume that's your photo, you know, the, the tribe's photo, uh, the Critvik photo, Canadian Critvik. And he said, well, no, actually it came from a guy named Bob Ede, E-D-E. -E. Ede he lived in Indomere, British Columbia, uh, up on the river up there. And um, so I called him and I said, God, that's a great photo. I just would love to use that in this book. And he said, sure, you can use it. My usual fee is uh, 150 bucks. And I said, oh, Bob, <laughs> I can't, I just can't do it. You know, that's just too much. Um, I, I mean, 
honestly, between you, me, and your, and your audience, if I make that much on this book, I'll be happy. <laughs> so I net that much. Yeah, yeah. You don't do yeah. this for money. You do it because you love the subject. And that's why I did it. Anyway, we had another long email. I talked to him on the phone and more email conversations. In the end, he said, I'll just use it. So I said, great, Bob, ah, thank you. Um, so I was really lucky in that regard. The photo I wish I could have used, I had, a, I had the captions written to go with it, was of Woody Guthrie. And uh, mm -hmm. Woody Guthrie was hugely important in the, in the development of the hydropower system in the Columbia River. Um, we all know the story of Woody Guthrie, 31, 31 songs in 29 days, working as a temporary employee for the Bonneville Power Administration. And everything about Woody Guthrie is tightly controlled by the Guthrie Family Foundation. And so when I found the photo I wanted to use, and they told me how much it was going to cost, it just took my breath away. Yeah. So I just can't do that. Yeah. And yeah. They, they would not bend. So that's fine. You know, I just, okay, how am I going to get around that? So how I got around it was to uh, write instead that the reason Woody Guthrie was hired, and I mentioned that in, in the caption of the photo, was to um, write songs for a, a um, update of a movie planned for 1941 that Bonneville originally had filmed in 1939, promoting hydropower, promoting Grand Coulee, the, the dam, Grand Coulee was completed in 1941. So the thought was, we'll have this film come out. Well, then World War II happened. And so the film wasn't finished until 1948. But um, the purpose, uh, the, the primary purpose of Grand Coulee was actually twofold. One was, one was irrigation, to irrigate the, the plain up on the Columbia Plateau. And Woody Guthrie wrote about that in several of his songs. Dry country, I can see the river 500 feet below. If we could only get the water up here, you know, we put people to work. And this was during the Depression. You um, the other purpose uh, was to promote rural electrification. At that time, it's hard to believe today, but at that time, electricity really was only available in the big cities. None of the privately owned utilities, there were no public utilities, none of the privately owned utilities would want to spend the money to build transmission lines out into the rural areas where there only be one customer every two miles or three miles or 10 miles. So uh, the idea behind Grand Coulee, one of them, was to electrify the rural areas, provide power at cost to people living in the rural areas and, and just make their lives so much better. Well, um, the way I got around not having the photo of Woody Guthrie then was to show a crowd shot that I got from the Grant County Public Utility District taken in 1937 or 38, I think, showing all these people from the Afreda area gathered for a huge picnic to promote public power, that, that they would create a public utility that they would form and get power from Grand Coulee and simplify their lives, make their lives a whole lot better. And all these cheering flag waving people were there in support of public power. And so that's how I got around not having the photo I wish I could have used. Yeah. And is there a photo, is there a photo, I, is there a photo I, I, I wish existed? Oh, probably hundreds. Yeah. You know. <laughs> yeah. I, I can't think of any good examples right off, but I can tell you this. There are almost no photos of, of two things. One, um, beavers. Beavers were hugely important to the fur trade in the early Columbia River. Photography didn't come along until the 1850s, but by the 1850s, the Hudson's Bay Company had basically trapped out all the beavers in the Northwest, trying to forestall competition, and keep uh, Americans and others away from the beavers. I wish there were more photos of beavers taken between like 1850 and 1900. I did find a good photo of um, a Colville Indian man and a woman, I believe was his wife, and they're posing at Fort Colville holding a um, river otter pelt. Mm. Now that's sort of my substitute for beaver. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. I wish, it, I wish there were more photos of First Nations. I, I found a couple of really good ones. Um, if you, uh, th there's a little glimpse of, of uh, First Nations culture in one of these photos. It shows a, a man, a woman, and a dog, and I think it a child, uh, sitting in a canoe on the shore of what I believe is probably Kootenai Lake. 
And they're probably, it could be in the Arrow Lakes too. Um, the, it's not clear where, exactly where it was taken, but it was up there somewhere, which would make them either um, um, uh, uh, Kootenai tribe of Idaho descendants, uh, forebears, or um, Sinaixt, uh, the people who lived along the upper uh, Columbia and Arrow Lakes. And what you can see in there is a sturgeon nose canoe, which was um, a popular design. It had a, a sloping front end. And it was, uh, it takes a shape from the shape of the nose of a sturgeon. Now that's, that's interesting. And I wish there were more photos of the indigenous peoples up there, but there aren't. So. Yeah, yeah. So the uh, related picture is there somewhere along the river before the dams came that you wish you could have seen what it was like before the oh, dams yeah, came? Oh, yeah, too. I would love to have seen both Celilo and Kettle Falls. I've seen photos of both yeah, of them. Yeah, yeah. But uh, if I could, if I could tesseract back, you may remember that word. Yes. Uh, to, <laughs> if I could tesseract back to about 1900, I'd love to see what it looked like at both Kettle Falls and Celilo. Yeah, yeah. Uh, before they both were yeah, gone. Yeah, I think about that every time I drive by that part of 84 and wish to, wish right. we could have seen it. Yeah. yeah. Were you able to travel at all while you were researching? Or because of, because of the pandemic? Stuck? <laughs> yeah, because of the pandemic, like everyone else, I was stuck. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, but I didn't need to. I mean, I had a lot of background already. Yeah. Um, I've, been at, I've been at this job dealing with Columbia River issues at my current employer, the Northwest Power and Conservation Council, for 31 years. So I've got a huge background. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm curious um, for people like who are care. starting to be able to get out a little bit, are there places that you love along the river that um, that you recommend to people who just kind of want to get a feel for the river itself and um, And then, you know, also just like towns that you love or places I that looks like your connection is a little bit slow. So we could, that's okay. Yeah, you know, you did too. <laughs> or is it better now? Yeah. Okay. It is better. I, I'm not sure what's going on. It might be our system, but I don't, my wife is watching a, something on the web at the moment. So. Yeah. So I was just saying if there was, are there places either like natural places or just fun little towns and stuff that you, that are staples for you when you travel along the river that you think other people would enjoy? Yeah. So, um, you know, two and a half hours from Portland is Astoria and there's great history there. The Columbia River Maritime Museum, the Clatsop County Historical Museum. Uh, and just walking along the riverfront and seeing the remains of the canneries, that's, that's all very interesting. Yeah. Um, you go up the river, um, well, it depends on how adventurous you want to be, but yeah. <laughs> um, um, Bonneville, Bonneville Dam on the Oregon side is a really interesting place to stop and see. It was the first dam completed, first federal dam completed on the river, and a lot of it, um, a lot of the old structure is still there. Uh, never it's been changed. And so, and they have a great visitor center. So um, that's good. And then farther up the river, if you really want to get out of, go out of your way, um, seeing Grand Coulee is an amazing, <laughs> amazing thing. It's, um, you know, I don't love hydropower, <laughs> but you, you can't help but be uh, awestruck by the size of that dam. And what, yeah. and what they did there, you know, 11 million cubic yards of concrete and more power than, than uh, anybody ever needed. And uh, it's amazing. And then farther up the river, um, trail uh, is it easy to drive to on Highway 25 across the border. Um, and then farther up, um, the cusp is uh, on the Columbia River, north of, um, of uh, Castle Gar, and it's a very small town, but they've got a great hot springs there. And the river in the area is just beautiful. And then farther up the river, Revelstoke is one of the most beautiful cities you'll ever see anywhere because it's surrounded by 12,000 foot, 10,000, 12,000 foot mountains. It's just stunning. 
And if you go across Rogers Pass and down into Golden, Golden itself is not so great. But if you go south down toward the headwaters, uh, Fairmont Hot Springs, which is right up by Columbia Lake, between Columbia Lake and Lake Windermere, the two headwaters lakes of the Columbia, is a beautiful old uh, mid-century Swiss-style resort. And uh, it's just gorgeous. It's right in the, in the valley of the Rockies. Uh, they've got four, I think, hot pools there. Lovely. And then, of course, if you're there, you've got to go see Columbia Lake. Because that is just, it's beautiful. There's a sign there, and there's a, there's a, a park, a pullout along the, uh, the Highway 93 runs along the western shore of the lake. There's a point where, uh, it's not right on the water, it's actually up on a hillside. There's a point there where there's a uh, public park. And if you get out of the park, you'll see a sign that says, <clears throat> Columbia Lake, headwaters of the Columbia River, which flows 1,243 miles to Astoria, Oregon, where it empties into the Pacific. So you've got to take a picture in front of that sign. <laughs> and then you've got to go to the actual headwaters end. And the reason I suggest that, if, and this, this, could, this could be a fun, you know, week-long driving trip or something. The reason I suggest that is that they build a really pretty, very interesting boardwalk out into this, to the, air, the, the wet area where the springs literally bubble up and form the beginning of the Columbia. Oh, so you can mean. stand there. You can stand there with your with your left foot on one side and your right foot on the other side of the headwater spring as it bubbles up. And you can say, "I have been to the actual headwaters." Of the mm, that's really and that's neat. what you're. I have plants. to put that on my list. <laughs> yeah. I think my last question is just kind of tie up the whole conversation is, you know, I know, I mean, this book is part of our conversation, but I also know that you've just worked on st stuff related to the Columbia River for a good chunk of your life. And I'm curious what your hope is of the river for the future. Ah. Knowing read all the, the challenges that we're facing. And well, you read the last caption in the, on page 126, where I, I wrote, um, there's a, a friend of mine, Bill Dietrich, who's written uh, a bunch of books. One of them is called Northwest Passage, the Great Columbia River. It is, is a great book about the river. Um, I could never hope to write that well uh, about the river. And he, he writes in there, and I agree, about the exhilarating future of the, the river, that we... We expect and we do take so much from the river in terms of hydropower, irrigation, flood control, navigation, even recreation. And, uh, and yet we try to balance uh, the, the, the natural river with the developed river. Uh, Richard White wrote a book called The Organic Machine in 1995, and that was his term for the river. It's an organic thing on the one hand, we still have salmon and steelhead runs, not like they were in the past, but they're still there. And there are parts of the river where it's just wildly open and beautiful. Um, and then we have the completely developed river, the hydropower, you know, the flood control, and so on. It's an organic machine. It's a machine that we put to work for our benefit, but it's an organic thing at the same time. And so in terms of what I would hope for, I, I'm not alone in hoping that somehow we can maintain, we can continue this balance, this really precarious balance between what we demand from the river and what we take from it and what we leave alone to remain natural. And it's my hope that the, the natural will never be overridden by the machine, by, by the mechanized Columbia, but that they'll always be able to exist in some sort of balance Many people would argue that, that it's way tipped in favor of development at the moment. And that's, that's, I can't argue that point. On the other hand, we developed this river for purposes to make our lives better. Think of, think of the time when the, dam, when the first two dams, federal dams, were built um, on the Columbia. Uh, Bonneville and Grand Coulee both started construction in 1933. That happened to be the year that the first dam across the river was completed. That was Rock Island, but it was built by Wenatchee, seven miles south of Wenatchee. But it was, um, it was built by a private power company. So it, 
that's important. But but think about this: that in the depth of the depression, uh, these two huge federal public works projects put people to work and brought people out of the depression, gave them jobs, and gave them livings. We don't understand that today. We, we just we just don't have really don't have a concept. We can read about it. We can see it in photos. We don't understand how important that was at the time, and. And so we did these things for great public purposes, to irrigate our crops and grow food, to, grow, to electrify the rural areas, to bring electricity to farms that never had them before. And, and today, um, we, you, you don't, I don't think we understand, and this is part of what I've been doing for the last 31 years of my life, is trying to explain these things, but you know, we plug in our cell phones and we expect them to charge. We flip the light switch and we expect it to come, lights to come on. A friend of mine, when I was a reporter at the Columbia and the public works director was a guy named John Ostrowski and he once said to me, no one cares about public works until they fail. And that is so true. So we, we expect so much from the river. We've taken so much for granted from the river. And um, I, I, I just hope that people maybe a little bit through this book can understand um, you know, in, in as few words as I'm allowed to, to write about it, <laughs> that we did these things that, that some people criticize today, that dams kill fish. We know that. It's true. But, but it's, not, it's not as true as it used to be because we've made it a lot better. Um, yeah. It's not all evil, you know. <laughs> we did yeah. these things for, for valid public purposes to make our lives better. Uh, to quote, uh, paraphrase Franklin Roosevelt in 1932 in Portland, we're going to electrify the next great hydroelectric development in the country has to be on the Columbia River because it will, it will bring, um, it will improve our lives. And it did. It really did. And we don't get that today because we have, we're so accepting of what we have. And so a little bit of that, I think, comes through in this book where you can say, well, I didn't know that before. I mean, this, is, this is why we did these things. Um, so that, that's kind of where I, I think yeah, I'd yeah. like to Well, thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you. And thank you. Just for everybody watching or who will watch this recording later, uh, I want to remind you that you can get copies of John's book at Vintage Books in Vancouver. Um, we have some signed copies in the store, so stop by or call or order online if you'd like a copy. And thank you again, John, for being with us. Thank you very much for having me. I really appreciated it. Have a, appreciate it. Have a great night. All right, thanks, Christy. Bye-bye.